Crisis on Infinite Earths is coming, and we have a boatload of amazing news about it, including Batman. And as Tom Hardy and Andy Serkis would say, we are Venom. I'm so excited. <laughs> We have a lot to get into this week on Collider Heroes. Uh, we had a bunch of news that was building up since the con about DCTV's Crisis on Infinite Earth event. Earth's event, a real sentence that we get to say out loud. And it's canon and people will know about it. Like the public are going to be talking about events like that. And they're going to be talking about, most importantly, Venom being directed by Andy Serkis. <laughs> Welcome to Collider Heroes number 317. I'm Amy Dallin. I'm Corey Jandro. And we are joined after a, too long an absence by our friend Jeff May. Thank it's you so me. much. It's me. It's me. I'm Jeff May and I'm back. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Welcome, I feel so, I'm so excited. Did you know... Andy Serkis is going to be directing Venom. Boy, you know, did you I know that? You know, we 100% all saw that coming. I don't know. I, I don't know if you heard that. I may have accidentally, uh, he posted, a, Tom Hardy posted on Instagram for 42 minutes, and I immediately screen grabbed it and tweeted it, and then he immediately <laughs> deleted it. So I tweeted this out like five days ago, and then I was like, oh, what have I done? Good. So you did nothing wrong. Tom Hardy did it first, yeah. which means it's okay. If you did something like Tom Hardy, you're fine. It's the move. Always be like Tom yeah. Hardy. Hashtag be like Tom. Hashtag Tom Hardy forever. <laughs> But we got to talk about some crises. We some do. Crisis. Okay. Crisis. There is, is that the word? Crisis? Crisis, crisis I think. Yeah. Chris Angel. That's also it. <laughs> is he appearing in DC TV's Crisis? Everyone else Who is. knows? Yeah. So here's a brief rundown on all the stuff we learned this week for, about DC TV's Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover. First of all, and this blows my mind, we're going to have to wait five weeks in the middle of this crossover. This, I mean, I can't imagine what this cliffhanger is going to be. Uh, we have three episodes in December and then two episodes on Tuesday, uh, like the 14th or something of January yep. to close out the thing. Uh, but Arrow we dies. also That's learned this week that Marv Wolfman is going to be co-writing uh, what the Arrow episode, um, which will be, again, helping to wrap up as they, they're barreling towards the fin series finale for Arrow. This will be, I think, episode eight out of a total of ten for that season, uh, which is the final episodes of Arrow ever. And as you can see right here, incredibly cool news about guest stars this week. Black Lightning finally gonna touch the Arrowverse. I honestly would have been pretty disappointed if you did Infinite Earths and could not work yeah. Black Lightning in there. <laughs> uh, and friggin' Kevin Conroy, the Batman of our hearts, appearing as a future live-action Bruce Wayne in some capacity in the crisis. Oh, and also, they're maybe gonna spin off another show from something that happens here. Who knows? So how we feeling? Kevin Conroy would have been enough, but adding Black Lightning, adding, I think, a Batman Beyond show. Uh, that's oh. my, I, can you imagine? They haven't done it in movies yet. I want a Wachowski directed, never going to happen that part, but <laughs> a Wachowski directed Batman Beyond, a Wachowski they flavored. They do TV now. But that, like, can you have them on the CW just being like, Put them on the they, gave CW, the yeah. they gave us let's do it. They're like, we just want to do teen drama, really. I mean, <laughs> Everything that's, else has gotten canceled. Just, the, whole, the whole Matrix thing, we've all just been building up to doing a Dawson's Creek reboot, <laughs> and really this is where there. we do like it. you wouldn't watch that on oh, day one. Oh, I would 100% watch that. <laughs> I'm like a defender of Jupiter Ascending. I'm the one guy left. Speed oh. Racer is one of the most underrated movies of all time. Agreed. Fact. But, I mean, th the three of us are the champions of this. And Emil Hirsch, who only comes back on Twitter to yell that. But I feel like this is the opportunity to launch something out of that world. They can't really do Batman in that universe, but they could do an alternate Batman. And who's the most popular? And who you got, Kevin Conroy playing Old Man Wayne? Yes. I, I do like that. Now, I want to know when the announcement is going to be that they're going to drag Linda Carter into this. So they've, they've said they're like in talks, but they don't know if it's going to happen. And then apparently the people who went out and said it was going to happen are not a legitimate news source, apparently. Oh. Yeah, can we say while we're on the subject of not legitimate news sources, there's been more and more clickbait on the on this side of the comic culture lately. And I feel like Comic-Con, like the three weeks leading up to and the three weeks after have been all about websites that are saying like, this is totally a thing. And then the actors being like, mm, I haven't heard that. Like Michael Rosenbaum had to actively go out of his way to be like, I'm probably not in this because I'm finding out by reading this website. Website. So yeah. stop lying. It Aww. hurts us all. But they're yeah. still getting ad revenue. <laughs> That's the thing is we click on it even if it's a yeah. lie. It's, it's the, so just be careful with your sources because a lot of people tweeted me and like told me because Michael Rosenbaum's my Lex that it was like if this is happening I was got real excited to click and be like oh this is the source. And we try to be careful with our sources and mark when things are just rumors. I had the Venom thing down because I was like maybe happening but then it was like <laughs> hastily update that to actually happening. Uh, but that's for the members of the press watching this show right now. <laughs> Let's all help each other be great at our jobs. Uh, for everybody else, what, what are we excited about? Uh, I'm, I'm, for the most part, I'm excited about having Marv Wolfman come, I mean, Marf Wolfman oh, come yes. in. I forgot to tell people who that is. Yeah, Mar I mean, Marv Wolfman is the architect. <laughs> 
I, I feel like I keep calling him Marf Wolfman by accident, but he is, <laughs> it's fine. Sounds. He can have the name. I wrote it for him. It's his. It's a <laughs> gift to you, Marf. Marf. You can have it. Uh, Marv Wolfman essentially was the architect of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Mm -hmm. he, with George Perez, with, they did uh, the entire original Maxi and, series. And and it is, I think, without a doubt, uh, the most important thing that's ever happened in DC Comics. It was the the first real sort of way to restructure an out of control Silver Age, mm -hmm. pull it back in. So to put him on and to give him reverence for the character and to put him on Arrow, which is where this whole thing started, I think is really important. And I think it really goes to show um, how much the creators on the TV side are respecting the creators on the comic side, which we have always wanted. Mm -hmm. yes. I think more than anything, we want be like, care about the comics. And they're like, we sure do. Marf Wolfman, no, Marf Wolfman <laughs> uh, is going to be writing the the cliffhanger return part for oh Arrow, which is scary to me because then you can start making predictions on what's going to happen. If there's only two episodes of Arrow after that, he those did. might be epilogue episodes for god's sake i feel like they talked about remember the conversation about a year ago and they were like we talked about having an arrow spinoff without arrow i'm like mm, two episodes of that huh yeah. to me this is them saying goodbye to arrow it's going to be him dying in the crisis i want to see someone carrying him out like george perez with supergirl yeah. and then supergirl the last, carrying yeah him yeah. carrying oh. out Stephen amell and Stephen amell is such a great emotive actor and like even his facebook like conversations are more emotive than most people on networks like he's a very good man so i'm really excited <laughs> he's, to see he's good at being a man he's a good <laughs> man he's emotive uh so i want to see him die so i think he'll do it well you know what anybody that's that good <laughs> needs so to go transition of all time. Like, you know he's just a really great dude yeah. so i can't wait to watch him perish i think but, he's gonna yeah. do it real well i'll be i'll be uh, doing a stand-up show and i'll see a comedian that i think is better than me i'm like he's gotta go <laughs> I can't Sorry. have him in my way. He's got to get out of here. This guy's too compassionate, kind, yeah. talented, and handsome. But you are right that I, I think that sort of, if you, like, there's a hint there. With Marv Wolfman writing the Arrow episode that is working <laughs> at the, that is the break of the cliffhanger mm -hmm. from this crisis tale that is also the end of the Arrow series, like, he's killing it. Like, I, yeah. Ugh. Like he knows he's, I mean, look at who he killed in crisis, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, look at the beloved character. Barry Allen got taken out and was gone for 20 years, something, something like years. That? Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize it was that long, but yeah, it would have had to be. It was 80, 86 we to 2000. Post, and it already happened because I was a baby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> this black lightning thing. Uh, we were teasing this, our last finale, our last big event roundup. We were like, do you think the next one Black Lightning? Because we all heard Crisis. We all think that was coming. But now the confirmation, I think this is a great opportunity to kind of play with the structure of the CW because we're adding shows or subtracting shows. Black Lightning, do you think it stays as part of the universe after this? Do you think there's ramifications? That's the big question. Uh, and I think it ultimately, when we talked about this before, we were sort of like, they, they like being independent. It lets them do their own thing. Um, now... Uh, we don't want to sort of b take that away from them or take the universe they've built away from them. Yeah. Uh, but it is, it's is—it's always been sort of like, what well, he deserves to be part of the family. And of course, canonically, we can't expect this crisis to go the way comic book crisis does because comic book crisis was a response to problems that were around in the DC universe. It was a fix as well as being its own story. Sure. Uh, a weird example of that working. Um, the like <laughs> ultimate example. The rare. Yeah, the yeah. exception to the rule. Uh, often imitated, basically never equaled. Uh, it, but the end result of that one, of course, was to collapse everything into one universe. But I don't exactly expect that here because they don't exactly want to say, like, let's say, dream world they get linda carter for a cameo they don't necessarily want to be like and that universe is destroyed forever you know like yeah. that's kind of a bummer yeah. uh, bye linda bye linda <laughs> on the other hand very dramatic yeah um now i have a question I, I i gotta be honest i don't follow black lightning uh where are we on static shock in this universe do oh, we yeah. have I think that yet a sign of the milestone, because guys. at this point in time depending on rights like, what if you then can incorporate a new show what if that's and it's show? Static Shock and Black Lightning coming in to be the catalyst that leads towards oh, that? Oh, man, like I love if that. I were if I were storytelling in this universe, if I were building up this universe and seeing what is needed in the structure of uh, CW television, what you need, and especially in the Arrowverse, mm -hmm. I think a young African American hero that is historically successful. Remember the Static Shock cartoon yes. went for three seasons, I think. Yes. Like, yeah, <laughs> Roka off screen is shouting for Static, which 
I, I, I got an, oh, you're gonna break my heart because now if it's not milestone, if it's not static, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be sad. So that's, oh. what's interesting is that a lot of the same reasons you're saying static is what I was thinking of Batman Beyond is we don't have a, a, a new young Batman because with Pattinson as Batman, we're not gonna have a Batman Beyond movie for 10 years. So I was thinking Batman Beyond because it'd be good to have a new young hero, have a different flavor. Arrow's a little older now. Grant Gustin's a little older. Supergirl, these, these are in their late 20s and they're CW actors. So the, they're playing that late 20s role. So having a a young Terry McGinnis is, is the time, but I like Static a little more now that you said it. I mean, I see, I love Batman Beyond. I'm obsessed with everything about it. I've watched the Darwin Cook intro over and over on YouTube. Like, I'm obsessed with Batman Beyond. Uh, in that universe, I, I know it would be expensive. Yeah, it would be very expensive. <laughs> it would be the priciest. It would be Game of Thrones level prices oh, at imagine? that point. I, I imagine it all the time. <laughs> um, I, think, I think Static is necessary. I think they'd be foolish not to bring that character. There are certain characters that DC has created that I love mm -hmm. that sort of get put by and, and you know they put get put in the wayside, put away, and they just forget about them. And I feel like Static gets that. And also Static had a very there's also some complications behind the scenes because Milestone was originally yes. its own thing and yeah. has been in and out of availability. But we see some of those characters over on Young Justice, mm -hmm. um, where they do mix it up with Black Lightning and a lot of other folks from the regular DC yeah, universe. So, and, so I would love to see them make these deals happen. And precedent uh, tying them together there in the uh, Justice League Unlimited episode with Batman Beyond Static. <sighs> And if even we get a cameo in this one crisis of Kevin Conroy referencing Terry, I'm happy. Like, even yeah. if Kevin Conroy is playing, like, with the Ace the Hound in his old man Batcave, old man Wayne, with Terry me mentioned, I'm happy. Because for the record, we're all hoping it's that, right? That essentially Kevin Conroy as an older Bruce Wayne is a Batman Beyond-esque or literally yes. Batman Beyond setting. I'm hope yeah, I think I, I'm assuming is probably too strong a word, but I'm assuming. I couldn't see him as a return, a Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. Because we build, do already he's... know we're getting a sort of Kingdom Come Superman. Yeah. And while... Brandon Routh and Kevin Conroy sort of indicate different age lines for that stuff. Um, we already, you know, they could turn around and be like, he's going to be Kingdom Come Back. Infinite Earths. <laughs> we have all of the options. Yeah. It's in yeah. the title. Let's put everybody in there. Let's yeah. do it. Add some cartoons do in there. You? Why not? Make yes. it like Cool World, you know? I, yeah, dude. Because we Spider talked Hand. about hoping like the coolest thing they could do would be to pop over to the animated universe and get Kevin Conroy. And right. they nearly did that. Yeah, they kind of did. <laughs> and like we saw with Spider-Verse, different animation styles with that totally work. What if they did that with live action? That'd blow minds. Okay. Okay, that, do you want Black Lightning to stay independent or be folded into the air? Uh, in conclusion, Black Lightning in universe, because I think it would it would bring more people over to it. Okay. I would say keep him independent, put Static in universe. Ooh. Uh, in Arrowverse. I think keep him independent, but let him visit all the time like Supergirl, and then <laughs> fold it in later. I don't know. Unless Amy hey, would be easy. She's like both. I want both. I mean, Can we I do always, both? I, I, if both answers are possible, that's always going to be my pick. Unless they really are doing like Crisis on Infinite Earths, in which case that would be as a way to get folded into the Arrowverse, to be folded in in Crisis, the most famous way of doing it, like, that would have its own amazing historical value. Mm -hmm. are, so, showrunners, do whatever you want, but you, uh, we're excited. Are y'all nervous for, for Grant, for Barry? I'm always nervous <laughs> like, for Grant. Like, he's looking, he's like, Crisis, huh? Oh, I've heard about this. <laughs> I know about. Th I know what happened in this. Hold on, let me, let me just do a speed read of this suit. script right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Always worried for Barry. He's yeah. too good. He's they, too wholesome. They played this on us with uh, last year's event. We both were like, so interesting about Supergirl and Flash, and so that's how they pulled that reversal with Arrow's deal yeah. to play with our expectations of that. Now we do have the classic. Flash vanishes in crisis is the way they set up their whole show. Um, but we also have a statement from, it was the Television Critics Association this week. They did all this press stuff. That's where all this information is coming from. They also said, essentially CW said, Arrow's going away and we're keeping everything else as long as we want to. We enjoy them. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't mean that these shows are indefinitely yeah. renewed, but it certainly sounds good for the continued life of Legends and Supergirl and Flash, which probably means Grant Gustin's okay, yeah, is where that answer fair. is going. Right, I, see the net. I like that they're like, we like making money off these shows. We're going to continue <laughs> doing that. Like, why wouldn't we continue doing that? We enjoy these numbers you're bringing I, in. I love, I love that. I, I love the idea, too, where it's like, they love the characters. Like, they love the revenue, too. Like, <laughs> they can, can do both. Yeah, do whatever you want. Like, as long as you guys are buying T-shirts, we're happy. <laughs> now, speaking of 
buying things. We have a new pull list this week, and oh. you should buy them all nice. because this week's pull list is incredible. Let's talk some comic books. Absolutely. Die number six by Karen Gillan and Stephanie Hans is back to probably make us cry more, but also have crazy D&D fantasy world adventures beautifully painted by Stephanie Hans. Our number two book is a number two book. It is Superman Up in the Sky number two, and it makes you understand Superman in a, in a way that I hadn't in a long time. Love this book. My indie check this out of the week is Berserker Unbound by Jeff Lemire and Mike Diodato. Uh, uh, it is, yeah. you can see, like a, mo- a Conan in Modern Day-esque story. Jeff Lemire is basically the best. Uh, you know you're, you're going to enjoy this. Oh, that Diodato. Uh, and I had to put this on here. It is absolute carnage number one, you guys. This book has been teased forever. It's Donny Cates. He's gonna, it's going to get messy. Uh, we also have the second issue of Lois Lane. Uh, Greg Rucka is doing his take on the fearless investigative journalist, dear to all of our hearts. There's so much more we're going to have to get into on Giant Size because, Koi, we, we had long lists this week. <laughs> yeah, Jack, do you have books. a favorite from among those or something uh, you want this week? I am very much looking forward to seeing the modern telling of Hercules in New York by seeing a a Conan archetype show up in the modern world. Like, like seeing that and then seeing Lemire and Diodato uh, as the as the team. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, give me that. Put it in my veins. <laughs> I will because I do actually work at your shop and we will pull it for you later. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> we also, speaking of corners of the DC universe that have been not yet been explored, Quite you got to have a very interesting conversation this week. My favorite new show of 2019 is Pennyworth. I love this show. I'm obsessed with this show. I've watched far too much of the show. I can't stop thinking about the show. And I sat down with Alfred Pennyworth and Thomas Wayne themselves Jack Bannon and Ben Aldridge, and it was fantastic. Check it out. Now, for me, I've always said that Luther is my favorite Batman show. Uh, Luther with Idris Elba, I always feel like he's effectively the world's greatest detective, and he's taking out these supervillains. Right. So when I watch Luther, That's I'm good. watching the goddamn Batman. Yes. This, to me, feels like as much a prequel to Luther as it does Harry Brown, oh, as it that. does Batman. I'm very into that. And I love the fact that this is so, and as, a, as an American, British. Yeah. Yeah. Is is there uh, someone on set that's basically keeping things through a through line, or you guys get to play with dialogue? Is the script written like the slang, the pace, everything feels like that that authenticity that that I only get to experience when it's done right? Right. That comes from Bruno Heller. Yeah. Okay. Um, One hundred percent. He's he's British. He's lived in LA for 20, 30 years. But the the great thing about the show is it has this almost nostalgia to a time, it's a love letter to Britain. And I must stress that it's a, it's a weird 1960s London. It's not the actual <laughs> it's 1960s not how it actually London. Is. It wasn't <laughs> actually like that. Um, but there's certainly, yeah, the bits in there and the authenticity and the bits that you think that is quintessentially British, that's, that's Bruno, um, mm. really. I mean, of course, we get to add Fair some a stuff. Bit. But I... Dan, really, because he's so good. <laughs> yeah. like, and you can kind of, you can kind of feel him enjoying that as well. Because I think he's written, he's written for the American accent and for American people for the last like 15 years, I think. So you can kind of feel him relishing, th- like thinking back to the 1960s, how people spoke, and he's very, very good. Each character has a very distinct voice, um, and a lot of detail in there. So yeah. So those guys are awesome, and the show is incredible, and I can't speak higher of it. It feels like a prequel to Luther and to Batman, and I think Luther's the best Batman show that's ever existed. Watch Luther and watch Pennyworth. So do you think they can somehow get this version of the Bat Universe into, despite all legal problems, the Crisis on Infinite Earths? <laughs> oh, man. If they saw a Jack Bannon just shows up, and there's like, Master Bruce, I'll, be, I'll lose my mind. You won't mind. individually die. I yeah. just can't. I won't even be able to hang. I won't even get to the Batman beyond of my dreams, because I won't make it past that moment. So speaking of wildly unexpected team-ups, uh, we got some very interesting news this week. Not only is we we all kind of expected Venom 2 to have some solid information coming soon, but I'm gonna say zero people were like, this is definitely what's gonna happen. <laughs> Andy Serkis is directing Venom 2 and I'm kind of thrilled. I think it's it's perfect. Uh, he knows how to do CGI and mocap. I don't think necessarily Venom's gonna be more mocap because they didn't actually use motion capture the last time. He wasn't wearing the gray suit with dots because Venom's bigger than him. You don't need a guy at five foot eight, Tom Hardy small doing a guy a seven foot venom. So I don't know how much of that expertise is gonna come in, but I love that Andy knows exactly how to frame things for special effects. I think this adds a visual element we didn't have in the last one. I liked the last one, I'm a defender of the last one, but <laughs> this gives a lot of credibility to the movie sight unseen. This announcement is huge. Jeff, what do you think? I, uh, Venom, uh, when I saw the movie, I was like, we owe Topher Grace an apology. <laughs> uh, that was my first thing. I, li- I actually like the movie because it owns how absolutely insane and kind of, kind of dumb it is like it's a dumb movie that's really fun 
And we're at that point in hero movies where we can have that. Mm. Like where we're getting like, oh, hero movies can be average or they can be stupid and silly. We can and, circle and, back around to that because it's not the only thing. Yeah, mm. it used to be we had to, everything had to be great because if we break the train, if we, you know, if it goes off the rails, then we're done here and people are going to see how it doesn't work. See, well, for now instance, movies starring women and people of color where they're just like, this better be the best thing ever or we're canceling all movies for the rest of time. Man, or if, a, if, if one of those movies comes out and it's just average and they're just like, see, see, and it's like, okay, calm the down. The blank bubble is burst. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's uh, a movie. With Venom, though, it's funny because it's so insane. I watch that movie and I'm like, this is, this is they're really going oh, for yeah. it here. <laughs> they, and there's like all these like twists and turns in, in motivations. And so when you throw in Andy Serkis as the director, I'm like, yeah, why not? <laughs> like, sure, sure. Like, throw him on. He, he can do stuff. He did a Jungle Book, right? Like... <laughs> So for me, Venom, the first one, you know, like gonzo journalism, the concept of like heightened reality and putting yourself in the story, like Hunter S. Thompson made this entire format. To me, Venom was the first gonzo movie for a superhero genre. It was a heightened reality that didn't make any sense a lot of the time, but I was all about the ride I was going on and acid helped. It, like it was a really great journey. In and theory, I, hashtag Koi Crimes. Conceptually, Koi Crimes. Uh, the, <laughs> the thing that worked for me was that they had leaned all the way in and adding Andy Serkis really means they're going to lean all the way in because Andy Serkis brings like this uninhibited flavor of madness and I think that's going to tie beautifully into whatever movie they make do you think Ruben Fleischer opted not to come back has other stuff that he's working on or do you think that the studio was like we want to try something different for number two I think Zombieland uh, distracted. Like, I think he wanted to go make the movie he waited 10 years to make, and I don't think he wanted to be multitasking. Yeah. That's yeah. fair. Stu studio's probably pushing for it, and he's like, I got stuff I got to do. Like, yeah. I got I to gotta my thing that I got to do, and I like your thing. It's great, and thanks for the money. Yeah. But I got to go do my thing now. <laughs> the cast of little-known actors plus Woody Harrelson is now Woody Harrelson, Jesse Eisenberg, and Emma Stone. I'm going to go make that movie yeah. real quick. I'm going to go hang out with all those Oscar winners real quick. <laughs> and make a sequel to the zombie sleeper hit of 2009. Yeah. So I think that it was a very... Very, I assume it was very mutual. We heard right after Venom, uh, as it was making a billion dollars, that he was not going to do the sequel. So it felt amicable mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. It didn't seem like, like I don't think they'd be like, eh, it only made a billion. We're really disappointed. Mm, I really think, underperformed. Yeah, that the one, movie yeah. no one thought would do well and everyone hated, made a lot of money. Venom, to me, reminded me a lot of The Mask, but without the comedy aspect of it. But <laughs> definitely in that, like, you're about this, like, gonzo idea. Because The Mask is like that, too, sure. where this world doesn't really exist, but it is the real world. It's a heightened reality. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think Venom really captured that. And so to bring Circus on, who you're right, like he's a guy who has worked exclusively in insane realities. <laughs> yeah. Like he's been doing like like he hit it on The Hobbit. And then you see him doing King Kong after that and, you, and, and or uh, Lord of the Rings before. Like he's doing all these things that are abjectly insane right. storytelling. Why not give him a shot to do something that is both insane, but also grounded in, in its own reality? What I'm really curious about is is what I I don't know very much about in terms of Andy Serkis as a filmmaker, like where his major interests are. Mm -hmm. Like it's obviously easy for me as an audience member to be like, I associate you with epic fantasy, with incredible sort of like his his heartbreaking golem and all of the stuff that he's invested in that. But I don't know yet his sensibilities. Like, is he would he be happiest doing like a heartfelt like doing Mouse Guard for us, or would he? Oh. Uh, which is I mean, you know, R. epic R. fantasy. R. Yeah. R. Mouse Guard. Uh, or is he dying for his chance to do like a bonkers? Uh, you know, I, I think I called it like a, it's it's like a universal monster movie, but in a sort of superhero genre, like which helped me to figure out what I was watching when I was watching Venom. Like, is this where his heart is? What is? <laughs> it's so hard to wrap your fingers around that around that that movie. It's so it's just you're just like what. What is it? What am I? What is happening right here? And I love are that about it. Fun. The villain is chewing the scenery in a truly epic style. I, I mean, sitting in a lobster tank. That and was eating my favorite. Like, like once that moment happened, I was like, "This movie's everything I wanted it to be." I, and to me, I was just like, "This movie is not anything I expected it to be." Let's roll with it. Well, I feel like people forget how funny and dark Venom is as like an abject uh, making fun of himself character. Like, there's a lot of weird stuff in Todd's Run and Lethal Protector and everything else. I feel like Andy Serkis's sensibilities are going to lend themselves to that because Smeagol is literally self-aware. It's the concept of like talking to oneself. And I feel like Andy Serkis, what he's done with Matt Reeves or with the Apes films, he can paint a world that shouldn't exist and make it grounded. So I want the last two acts of Venom to be all of the next movie because we've established the weirdness. So now Andy Serkis can play as he has with the Apes, as he has, and he grounds like, you shouldn't believe in Caesar. I was rooting for Caesar mm. a lot of the time. And he was against the humans. And, and the like, thing, because it was him. One thing we know for sure, uh, as we like all tend to blend our feelings about Smeagol and Gollum with Andy 
Andy Serkis, the human. Uh, uh, we can't help it. You're too good. Uh, we we know for a fact that Andy Serkis takes seriously these kind of non-standard performances, mm -hmm. these performances in combination with technology, these performances in combination with motion capture or other effects. He is extremely invested because he's a master of the craft in the idea that those are all valid tools of storytelling. So you know this isn't a guy who's like, oh, it's some special effects thing? Sure. Right. You know that's not the guy who's making Venom, which we, makes me very excited. I, I agree. They didn't go with a, uh, an action director that hadn't done this thing. They didn't go. They went with the, the more bizarre choice. He's, as far as I know, only done Mowgli, which which was a you know a large yeah. special effect house situation. And then he's going to this, which made a billion dollars. So he's Sony got a few other credits, them. and we got to do our we'll, we'll do our homework, and then yeah. we'll return. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. check it out. He's a master of duality, and I'm excited to see where he goes with it. Yeah. So there's so much more that broke this week. We are going to get into it on Giant Size. Uh, the Kitchen has had its premiere, which I love reminding people, is a comic book movie. Thank you. Uh, the Runaways are going to meet Cloak and Dagger. We got some interesting Eternals and New Gods tidbits this week. We have a lot to talk about and your Twitter questions. That'll all be on Giant Size. But first off, thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. I was glad to be back. Where can the people find you on the uh, internet? Well, you can find me. I do a podcast called Sideshow Sideshow with Jeff May with Sideshow uh, Collectibles, uh, as well as I have a, a show called Tom and Jeff Watch Batman uh, with uh, Tom Ryman from Collider actually and uh you can check that out on gamefully unemployed and then you can find me on the internet my my at is probably down here somewhere on the screen uh <laughs> and hopefully here in the future again sometime yeah, man. thanks for joining but us yeah yeah thank, thank you. you for joining us in your excellent t-shirt oh shout out to marvel tales <laughs> yes i just saw that yes perfect and until next time stay, stay sweaty, sweaty.